Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all set within and beyond the West End. Today's episode is the final part about the murder of John Monkton. A devoted father and loving husband brutally stabbed to death during an attack on his own home. Monday the 29th of November 2004, at 7.29pm. An r Ford Mondeo idled on Glebe Place. A quiet, unlit side street alongside the Moncton's family home. 23-year-old Elliot White was sat in the driver's seat. Wearing a black woolly hat, a fluorescent jacket and a postal sack, he giggled at the stupidity of his disguise. Oh man! I look like Postman Pat. But that was the plan. It's inherently racist, but a black youth knocking on doors in a posh white part of Chelsea will always arouse suspicion, unless he looks like a tradesman. And as all burglars know, the difference between a locked door and an open one can be something as subtle as an ID, a uniform, or a parcel. So being blessed with a baby face and a cheeky grin, Elliot could unlock any latch with a few words and a smile. But Damien could not. So that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 132, The Trader and the Devil's Child, Part 2. Elliot was typical of the type of burglar known as a chancer, a non-violent opportunist driven by need. Born on the 15th of March 1981, Elliot didn't have the best start in life, but then again, it wasn't the worst. Raised by a good mother in the basement flat of a three-story terrace at 22A Richmond Way in Shepherd's Bush, he was smart, a little unruly, but with a burning desire to succeed. Age 16, he achieved 10 GCSEs and went on to study art at college. Aged 18, Described as immature and easily led, he drifted into recreational drug use, became a drug dealer to fund his habit, and in one stupid mistake, he ruined his life. On the 17th of October 2001, age 20, convicted of intent to supply heroin and cocaine, he was sentenced to 18 months. With 13 spent at HMP Dover Prison, and five months on a HDC, a home detention curfew, where he was electronically tagged and required to stay at his mum's home between 7pm and 7am. On the 15th of July 2003, convicted of two further counts of intent to supply Class A drugs, the justice system aimed to change his criminal behaviour through work, education and counselling so he was placed on a 12-month CRO, a community rehabilitation order. Again he was tagged, again he was curfewed, and again he would be monitored, with any breach resulting in his immediate return to prison. But just like the HDC, the CRO would lead to a catalogue of systemic failures. His CRO started on the 15th of July, with the rule that he must meet every week for the first 12 weeks with his youth offending team officer. But the London probation team failed to contact him until the 7th of August. He missed his first appointment, ignored their warning letters, and by the 16th of December, four months later, he hadn't been returned to prison and the breach was blamed on administrative errors. 
In February 2004, he was convicted of two further counts of intent to supply and should have been sent back to HMP Dover, but he wasn't. As his HDC and his CRO had failed, they put him on a DTTO, a drug treatment and testing order. Again, he was tagged and curfewed, but this time he was required to attend a drug treatment center five days a week, with any breach resulting in his immediate return to prison. But again, it didn't. He missed his first DTTO assessment. He failed to attend a further five, and his swab tests were positive for cocaine, morphine, and cannabis. So what drove Elliot White to play his part in the brutal murder of John Moncton? Simple. They were two different types of burglars. Elliot was a chancer, and Damien was a confronter. Born on the 17th of December 1980, Damien Hansen had very few positive influences in his life. Described in court as a boy with low self-esteem or self-confidence, he was anxious to seek the approval of others, but burdened by few skills and an aura of evil, he used violence to get what he wanted. Being gruff, angry, and being five foot four inches high, as short as Elliot, the two boys met in primary school and became pals. But Elliot's mother never liked Damien, hence she nicknamed him the Devil's Child. Age 10, he was expelled from school. By the age of 16, he had six criminal convictions, including theft and the indecent assault of a girl when he was only 12 years old. But for this, he was put on a supervision order. Age 14, he was convicted of ABH and assault. But being so young, instead of prison, he was ordered to pay compensation and was sent to an attendance centre. That same year, he burgled a house in Fulham, but wasn't imprisoned. He was given a conditional discharge, meaning he wouldn't be charged for the offence and it would be removed from his record if he didn't re-offend over the next 12 months. Ten months later, he was convicted of stabbing 17-year-old Kevin Jones whilst robbing him of just £20. Damien was sentenced to 18 months in a Young Offenders Institute, where a psychological assessment concluded Hansen's offences were not committed when he'd lost control. Rather, he employed violence as a strategy to get what he wanted. Three months before his 17th birthday, he was charged with attempted murder. Following a bungled robbery on Erkenwald Street in East Acton, which left a 16-year-old boy alive, but seriously wounded. On the 1st of April 1998, Damien was sentenced to 12 years for attempted murder. With the judge insisting, he must not be released until he has served at least two-thirds of his sentence. But again, an overworked system led to gross incompetence and a catalogue of administrative errors. On the 19th of July 2004, his parole was reassessed. Only this time, he wasn't interviewed in person, his probation officer hadn't met him in over a year, and even though the offender group reconviction scale had stated that Damien had a 91% probability of violent reoffending, with 75% regarded as high risk and requiring that his release be monitored by multi-agency support, including social services, the probation service and the police. The board didn't believe that he had a predilection for violence. On the 27th of August 2004, Damien Hansen was released on bail. 
but the mistakes didn't end there. Although convicted of attempted murder, Damien was placed on the lowest supervision level. He was held to a light curfew of 11 p.m. to 6 a.m., and he was banned from entering the borough of Hammersmith in Fulham. Although, unless arrested, the agencies had no way to disprove this. Having repeatedly breached his parole, this should have resulted in his immediate recall to prison. But it didn't. Elliot White and Damien Hansen, a petty drug dealer and a remorseless thief, were tagged, curfewed and supposedly monitored by a series of overworked agencies whose aim was to rehabilitate them and to protect us. And yet, under their very noses, both men returned to a life of crime and ultimately a murder. Damien's new life as a free man was spent in room two of the Hestia Bale Hostel in Streatham, South London, an assisted living space which helped him cook a meal, clean his clothes, pay his rent, and learn the value of an honest day's work. But as part of his bail conditions, his room was routinely searched by staff for drugs, weapons, and pornography. During these three months, he acquired two baraclavas, a six-inch knife, and a gun, as well as compiling a scrapbook of potential targets, including their routines, registration plates, habits, haunts, and home addresses. He researched locks, alarms, and the value of diamonds, and courtesy of the Sunday Times Rich List and the Mail on Sunday's Rich Report, he had profiles on some of Britain's wealthiest men. On an unspecified date in November 2004, Damien prowled the supposedly fashionable streets of the King's Road in Chelsea on the hunt for easy prey. In the past, being a coward who was small and slight, he always attacked boys or those weaker than himself. And this time would be no different. From the sophistication of Via Venisi, a designer shoe shop at 163 Kings Road, he spotted a wealthy banker's wife, who was rich, petite, and defenseless. Following her back to 30 Upper Cheney Row, he could have robbed her right there and right then, as there were no cars, no people, no cameras, and very few windows overlooking this quiet little street. But he didn't. It's inherently racist, but a black youth walking down a posh white part of Chelsea will always arouse suspicion, especially if he has an aura of evil like Damien. He knew if he could somehow get inside her four-story townhouse, quietly and quickly, without raising any alarms, he could rob her in private. But this left him with a big problem. Damien Hansen was hardly the sort of person a stranger would willingly open a door to. What he needed was a plan, a uniform, a parcel, and a baby-faced accomplice. Monday the 29th of November 2004, at 7.29pm, an R. Reg Ford Mondeo idled on Glee Place. 23-year-old Elliot White was sat in the driver's seat. Oh man, I look like Postman Pat. And beside him, all dressed in black, was sat the devil's child. Owing a drug dealer £2,000, burglary wasn't Elliot's thing. But as all he had to do was get a woman to open a door, it was a no-brainer. At least, that's what he thought as although the two men had shared the same plan, Elliot and Damien were two very different types of burglars, an opportunist chancer and a violent confronter. 
Suddenly, the two men sidled up to the doorway of the home of Homira Moncton. In the basement kitchen, a meal was cooking. In the first floor lounge, the TV was on. And somewhere on the two floors above, a lone defenseless female had finished bathing her nine-year-old daughter. At 7.30pm, the doorbell rang, and the intercom crackled into life. Hello, who is it? A woman inquired. Putting on his calmest and friendliest voice, Elliot said, Postman, I've got a parcel here for a Mr. John V. Mumpton. She didn't query it. And why should she? As we all know, Burglars don't ring doorbells. Elliot patiently stood on top of the steep stone steps, unable to hear anything from within, except the owner descend the stairs, the inner door open, and the spy hole darken briefly as a cautious eye peered through its fisheye lens into the dark unlit street beyond. Given the steepness of the steps, all she would see was a smiling postman, as hidden behind his back, a maniac was crouched, ready to attack. With a thick security chain on, the white door opened. Only this was not Homira Moncton, as through the slightest of cracks, Elliot craned his neck up to see a man who was easily a foot taller than himself. Hello? The man inquired. He wasn't expecting a parcel, just as they weren't expecting a man. For a second, the two traded glances. Elliot grinned, Parcel for Mr. Moncton. As the man's eyes went from the postman to his uniform and to the parcel. Unable to see the devil's child bathed in black. In court, Elliot would claim that he didn't know that Damien was armed with a gun and a knife. So having said, You'll need to sign for it. He undid the chain, unclicked the lock, and as his last line of defence, John Moncton opened the door and let in the evil. Unlike the probation and parole service, who had systematically failed to protect the public, thanks in large part to the incompetence of the two assailants, the police investigation was swift and thorough. The scene was sealed off, eyewitnesses were canvassed, and a fingertip search was conducted of the surrounding areas. In terms of evidence, the walls and floor of the hallway and stairs were soaked with the blood of both John and Hermira Moncton. But among this spattered mess of red, a third blood group was found. As so violent was the attack, the crazed knifeman had stabbed his accomplice in the left-handed arm, leaving a bloody trail from the doorway, down the stone steps, and vanishing halfway up Glebe Place. Sadly, the murder weapon was missing. But on the hallway floor, the bungling assailants had dropped a crumpled cardboard box addressed to John V. Moncton, complete with a sample of their handwriting and a set of fingerprints. And although they had cunningly disguised their features, one witness had seen everything. Interviewed by specially trained officers, although this nine-year-old girl was deeply traumatized by the horror she had seen, as she sat cradling her toy rabbit, she described the attack in detail. How she peeped through the banister rails and from the top floor, 
watched helplessly as a masked maniac stabbed her screaming mummy, left her daddy dying in a bloody heap, and fled from her home, laughing. There was no doubt that by keeping quiet and still, she had saved her own life and that of her mother too. But also, she was able to recall a key detail which no one else knew. The knife man wasn't only dressed entirely in black, as on the back of his jacket was a very unique motif which he drew for the police. Vanishing amidst the evening traffic, Elliot's black Ford Mondeo weaved its way seven miles southeast and roared up a patch of wasteland off Lunnan Road in Upper Norwood. Opposite a line of occupied homes, they stuffed the postal sack full of their bloodstained clothes, soaked it in petrol and set it alight. At 8.55 p.m., London Fire Brigade were alerted to a small suspicious fire. They extinguished it, and as was protocol, they informed the police. Forensics bagged up the remnants. Still recognizable were pieces of baraclava, a postal sack, a fluorescent jacket, and a black jacket made by Academics A9 which was spattered with both John and Hermira Moncton's blood. And on the back was a very unique motif, which matched Isabel's drawing. From the crime itself to the actual arrest, it would take the police roughly two weeks. Sadly, not every organization was as thorough and diligent with their duties. Being tagged, curfewed, and supposedly monitored, strict bail conditions were repeatedly breached as they entered Hammersmith and Fulham, carried offensive weapons, communicated with offenders, and committed a series of criminal acts, including burglary, theft, ABH, attempted murder, and murder. But so uncaring were these little thugs that just shy of 10 p.m., they caught a taxi to Shepherd's Bush and stopped off at the Best Western Caribbean takeaway to fill their bellies. Again, it took a few good citizens doing the decent thing to bring a murderer to justice. As when the takeaway staff saw blood running down Elliot's arm, they contacted the police and handed over the footage. At 11.09 p.m., having broken his curfew, Damien entered his hostel, but this breach was not reported. The next morning, Elliot went to the Mayday Hospital near Croydon to have his knife wound stitched. To cover this breach of his DWTO, he had his GP write the following note. It read, This is to confirm that the above man was stabbed in the left hand and arm on Monday the 29th of November 2004 at 6 p.m. This letter should have rung alarm bells for the probation team, but it didn't. Fingerprints, DNA and blood stains found at the scene of the burn site led the police to Elliot White. He was arrested on the 14th of December 2004 at his mother's home at 22A Richmond Way in Shepherd's Bush. Checking his GPS and phone records, police linked Elliot to Damien, and on the 16th of December, Damien Hansen was arrested at his bail hostel and finally recalled to prison. The trial was held at the Old Bailey before Mr. Justice Calvert Smith. In court, the two childhood friends blamed each other and repeatedly told a litany of lies, which were easily picked apart by the prosecution. The evidence was overwhelming. It included bloodstains, DNA, fingerprints, a petrol can, the parcel, CCTV footage, the dossier, 
a business card from Via Venisi, and the burned fragments of the postman's outfit as worn by Elliot, and Damien's black jacket with a very unique Academics A9 motif. Their criminal history was used in evidence, as well as the offender group reconviction scale, which warned that Damien had a 91% chance of violent reoffending, and his psychological assessment, which stated, he employed violence as a strategy to get what he wanted. Even Damien's own defense counsel had to admit, I cannot explain why a robber should force his way into a house and immediately attack his victims with a knife. There are no mitigating factors here which are worthy of consideration. On Friday the 3rd of February 2006, Elliot White was found guilty of manslaughter. He was sentenced to 18 years in prison. But with only three years left to serve, it is likely that he is already out on parole, having been tagged and curfewed, with any breach supposedly resulting in his immediate return to prison. Damien Hansen was found guilty of robbery, attempted murder and murder. Mr. Justice Calvert Smith recommended that he serve a minimum of 36 years before parole is considered, by which time he will be 61 years old. That is one of the longest minimum terms ever handed down in British legal history. An inquiry was ordered by the Home Secretary Charles Clark into the actions of the Probation Service and the Parole Board. In the report, they admitted there had been mistakes at all levels, that the system went wrong, and that it was implementing a root and branch overhaul of the way it manages offenders. Four probation officers were temporarily suspended while a review was carried out but their lack of supervision of Damien Hansen and Elliot White was not directly blamed for the murder. John Monkton was a devoted father and loyal husband, who, as everyone would, provided a safe and loving home for his family. And although every security system has its faults, what he didn't expect was to be failed by the agencies whose job it was to monitor the prisoners and to protect the public. Had they done their job properly, he would never have opened his door to the devil's child. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. That was the final part of The Trader and the Devil's Child. If you enjoyed that, stay tuned for some additional details and lots of pointless twaddle after the break. Or don't. That is entirely your choice. Before that, here's a true crime podcast, which may very well be the last tequila shot in Eva's bevy of late night cocktails just before she has her kebab. Clarissa frantically called 911 and told the operator that she was 36 weeks pregnant and had just given birth at home, but the baby wasn't breathing and had turned blue. Paramedics quickly arrived and took Clarissa and baby Zander to the hospital, where he was rushed to intensive care. Hospital staff noticed that Clarissa's arms, hands and face were covered in blood assumedly from the home delivery. But when they managed to check Clarissa over, they made the chilling discovery that she showed no signs at all of having given birth. Red Rum is a podcast focusing on the true victims of crime. Search Red Rum True Crime wherever you get your podcasts. 
A big thank you to my new Patreon supporters, who are Hannah Swinson and Katie Oliver. I thank you all. I hope you're enjoying all of the exclusive goodies that you won't find anywhere else in the world. And a thank you to Salva Wiggins for your very kind donation. It's very much appreciated. Plus, as always, a thank you to everyone who continues to listen to Murder Mile. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. Oh dear God, no! Ow! <coughs> oh dear, hello everyone. Welcome to Extra Mile. Hey, Extra Mile time. Uh, for new people listening in, you're going, what's this? Uh, what's going on? This doesn't sound like the first bit, which was uh, very uh, uh, written and controlled and contained. No, this is all waffle. If you don't like chatty, chatty, waffle, waffle, leave now. Go elsewhere. Go and listen to something else. If you do enjoy chatty, chatty, waffle, this is for you. This is why I do this. So, uh, uh, oh, just getting rid of... Uh, Oh, just getting rid of the pillows behind oh, behind my head. I'm going to open a window because I need some air. It's very early, very, very early, uh, because uh, not only am I near a little airport where all the, as mentioned last week, all the little bastards come out in their little. Oh, oh, I need to. I, oh, oh, I need to show everyone how posh I am by by flying my little aircraft all oh, oh, across across London. Going. Ee! Which has a little has a it has a little tiny engine in it that sounds like a little moped. Like nee! it sounds really horrible. So they do that. So I uh, also the bastards at HS2. HS2 the the new supposedly super fast uh, high speed train network that's that's going through the country and literally ripping up the country uh, because apparently people want to get to Manchester half an hour quicker or something. Who freaking cares? It's all bollocks anyway. Those bastards wake up early and they've got a new drill. And the new drill sounds like that sound in War of the Worlds, Joe, you know, the Steven Spielberg version, where it goes. <laughs> and every 20 seconds you hear. <laughs> it's really horrible. So, <coughs> oh, I shouldn't have done that. Right, let me just put on my, my uh, coffee. Quaffy. I need a quaffy because it's bloody early. I'm going to open the window. I'm going to open that as well oh that's better you can hear all the tweety birds all the blackbirds are out going uh, i need sex i need sex that's all they do they wake up in the morning and they just go i need sex tweet 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 i need sex they really really need to go to a, a, a sex clinic and get themselves sorted out because if they if they wake up every morning and the first thing they're thinking about is tweet 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 i need sex come on guys you got a bit of a problem there wake up uh hang on just doing that maybe that's it maybe that's it maybe blackbirds are the russell brand russell brand yeah the russell brand of birds so they all they all they want to do is do shaggy 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 mm, shaggy right oh look i well, we've got a new bakery near me uh, so I tried it the other day. It, annoyingly, they, it's one of those bakeries where they open really early and then they shut like about one o'clock. And you just think, why? People want cakes all day, every day. But they they open early to do all the breads and then they disappear. So in front of me, I've got a nice donut, nice big jam donut, about the size of a fist, looks very good. And then a, uh, a uh, chocolate shortbread. So it's shortbread on one side with... Um, uh chocolate chips on the inside and then half of it has been dunked in chocolate and have i already had one of each yes i bloody have am i going to eat these during this morning yes i bloody am do, do they do belgian buns yes they do do belgian buns and they're very nice they're very nice i've eaten those already and i've had some baker or tarts they were very nice as well all very good uh what else is going on in the world uh an update from uh episode th 130 the falling man where uh, I, I I clearly wasn't in a very good mood in the extra mile on that one, and I wasn't because I'd been having a, having a, a bad week, and uh, 
Uh, it continued for about another week or so, and because I, I was getting really bad heart palpitations and headaches, and uh, I seemed to be passing passing out while sitting down, and and unable to breathe too well while I was uh, asleep, and that was uh, getting pretty bad. And I was uh, calling up the NHS director, and they were going, "Oh, it's Joe. It's probably anemia." I was like, it can't be anemia because I eat all my vitamins and minerals. But I increased all my uh, my iron content and I I, you know, I I drink a lot of water and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, why is it still happening? And why am I passing out when I'm sitting down and lying down? And then I thought, What's, what have I changed in the last two weeks, two, three weeks, which is um, uh, could could be a problem now. Am I eating something different? Because pretty much my life is very much routine. My, my kettle is about to go. Look, it's about to go. Oh, it's going to spoil the plot. Anyway, uh... The, the only thing that had changed in the last week or so... Oh, look at that. The kettle decides to spoil the punchline. There we go. You'll have to tune in next week to find out. No, I'm joking. Got a coot outside my, coot outside my window who loves crackers. I've tried, to get, I've tried to lure him in with peas and things like that, but uh, he seems to like crackers. So, you know fine if he likes them he likes them no I, I i thought to myself what has what have i changed in the last two weeks and the only thing that i changed in the last two weeks was my watch broke and i refixed the strap and uh this is my pedo meter it tells me how many pedophiles i'm passing uh it, part of it had broke so i restitched it uh but it made for a much smaller strap uh and then as i was walking along i thought oh, maybe Maybe it's on too tight. So I just I just took my watch off and then I realised there was rubbing on it. Took off my watch. Uh, and that night I had a really good night's sleep and I haven't had any palpitations since. So that's it. That's what it was. I literally was passing out because my watch was on too tight. It didn't feel too tight. That's the annoying thing. It didn't feel tight. But it was on just a little bit too tight for my wrist. And therefore it was trapping the circulation of the blood going down through the wrist. Which meant the heart couldn't catch up which is why I was struggling. If you go back to the start, I locked down back to, to more than a year ago. I did the same going to Tesco's wearing gloves. I was wearing gloves and I was passing out in Tesco's and I realised I was wearing gloves that were too tight. Jesus Christ, what's going on in the world? Anyway, anyway, it's all it's all weird. You can hear, a, you can hear Tweety Birds now, the Blackbird's back, going sex, 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 and uh, uh, little shitty aircraft above. Oh, and some crows as well. What else happened? I saw a guy yesterday in the bakery who looked exactly like Dennis Nielsen. Very weird. He looked like Dennis Nielsen in his 30s. Uh, did I take a picture of him? No, I did not. Uh, I think that's it. Um, let's let's dive into some stuff. Oh, let's, uh, let's do the quiz and then we'll dive into some stuff because there's lots of stuff we can dive into with this. Uh, as always with the quiz, uh, sometimes I might balls up some of the questions. I might give away the answers when we go through the extra mile bit. Uh, that happens. Uh, and sometimes things will be edited out of the episode. As with question number one, which will be from last week's episode. Uh, but you wouldn't have known the answer because I edited it out. Sometimes, sometimes things just don't fit in the episode and sometimes I have to chop them out. Uh, okay, so uh, question one. What was the name of the shoe shop that Homira Monkton often visited? Uh, question number two. What type of car did Elliot drive? Question number three. How much money was it said that Elliot owed to drug dealers? Question number four. Name the takeaway that Damien and Elliot went to. Ooh, got burpees again. Question number five. Elliot was held under a HDC, but what does HDC stand for? I would expect Police Constable Arsenal Guinness to get this one right. If he doesn't, slaps on the wrist. His Guinness drinking wrist as well, which we both know is uh, both wrists. Uh, I think he just uh, absorbs Guinness through osmosis. <laughs> Uh, question number six. Damien was convicted of what crime aged 12? There was actually two crimes aged 12, but uh, so you can, you can name either if you like. Uh, question seven. Elliot was stabbed in what two places? I've written toe places there. Uh, Elliot was stabbed in what two places? Uh, question eight. 
What make of garage did they purchase the petrol from for the fire? Question nine. What floor was Isabel on when she witnessed the murder? And question 10. Damien stayed in what number room at the bail hostel? Whoa, oh, exciting questions. How many did you get, do you reckon? How many did you get? I, I'll be honest, some, it, it's hard to get them all because these, these are some of them are easy questions. Like what type of car did Elliot drive? I think everyone could get that because I think I mentioned that like maybe 10 times and in the last episode as well. But some of them are very difficult. Uh, interesting fact here, uh, the getaway car that they used was, part, was parked in front of West House on Glebe Place. And if you've ever been on Glebe Place, you will see a nice big posh house. And that was Uncle Monty's house as used in the film with Nell and I. So uh, uh, when they initially, not, not, not the place out in the country, but when they first pull up to Uncle Monty's house and uh, 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 the, the, cat, the cat is spoiling their evening. He goes, oh, that oof has ruined my day. That's, it's, it's in, that's in there. Uh, so I thought you might like to know that. Very interesting. Right, let's have a look. Uh, Elliot White, let's have a look at him. It's, it's interesting when you look at these boys because um, they're not thickies, really. When you look at them, they, they, they've both got decent intelligence about them. So Elliot White, you know, everyone said he was smart, a little bit unruly, but had a desire to achieve something of himself. He left school age 16 with 10 GCSEs, which is pretty good. That's pretty good. I left with eight and did two more at college. So, you know, he's two ahead of me. And then he went on to a college and studied art and design. Uh, he lived with his mum on Richmond Way in Shepherd's Bush. Uh, if you know Shepherd's Bush at all, so just uh, where the big roundabout is and the Thames Water Tower is, it's just to the side. So it's all right. You know, there's some, some quite nice houses around there. And it's... Uh, uh, prior... Uh, um, so prior to the uh, age of 20, he had no criminal convictions at all. Uh, age 20 was his first one. And that's for drugs offences. That's for... Uh, 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 intent to supply class a drugs so cocaine and heroin so it doesn't mean he didn't do anything criminal prior to that but he wasn't convicted of anything prior to that uh, he doesn't have any minor offenses so it does it does seem when you look at his history it, it does seem that he uh, he was doing well at school he was doing well at college then he left college and then he was kind of like as a lot of people do, do you know you come out of college you're not in a job you're a bit lost some bit you know, your early 20s are a difficult time and fortunately he kind of uh went into recreational drugs which went into becoming a drug dealer and that basically was the end of his life um after his hdc which is one of the questions see i'm doing well now aren't i i'm not ruining things uh he was moved on to a 12 12 month cro as police constable arsenal Win guinness will know is a community rehabilitation order i hope you knew that should do uh during this period uh he would have received help from support worker workers drug workers uh career advisors and uh he would have uh, he would regularly meet with his youth offending team officer this order states states that he uh, he needs to keep a minimum of 12 appointments in the first 12 months at uh, first 12 weeks sorry a failure would return uh, result in his return to court or prison and that he must uh, behave himself keep away from other criminal behavior and other criminals uh, if you miss an appointment you have to pre-warn your case manager and have a good reason if you miss two appointments following warnings these will result in a return to court or prison these are the rules unfortunately the rules weren't actually that well implemented as we've seen um uh when he started his, his uh cro on the uh the 15th of july 2003 um uh they they failed to contact him do you know which didn't actually put him in a good stead if you think about it their their job is to say you need to abide by these rules and they're being lackadaisical with it and they're just not they, so from this point onwards he's just like well why should i really obey the rules if you're really not doing it yourselves uh 7th of august his file states that his file is a late allocation it is it is they they're actually written in the notes it is not his fault and he has not been contacted until this date um he because of that he failed to attend his first appointment and his response after that was pretty poor despite warning letters uh, and it kind of just goes on like this it keeps like there's a lot of failings on their behalf and because they fail uh he fails as well so um 
they didn't actually end up contacting him again until the middle of December. That's four months later, which is pretty piss poor. Uh, what else is on there? It's I, I've I've got a list of them on there, and it's just like it's it's silly. It's like he, he's on a CRO, and you know he breaches that. Then he uh, gets arrested uh, for two counts of possession of the intent to supply cocaine and heroin. So the same offence he was charged with before. But again, he's bailed. Again, he's put on a rehabilitation order. And it's just like they're trying and trying to say to him, look, if we put some trust in you, therefore, you know, you don't have to go out and do all the, do these uh, offences. You can go out, become a, a regular member of society. And he's just like, no, I want to be a drug dealer. Uh, well, um, you know, it, it, I'm sure he's part of it. It's down to his. It, it, this is the weird thing, because when you go into his notes, a lot of the people in there don't seem to say he does. He doesn't come across as a drug addict. He, Joe, he's smart, he's presentable, he's, he's, he's chatty. He comes across as a a wannabe drug dealer who's kind of dealing. He wants the fancy cars and he wants the nice clothes and he dresses well and he wears all the jewellery and stuff like that. You know, but he's, uh, you know, he's, he's not a rambling mess like you'd expect by a lot of drug dealers, but he does use drugs, so they are in his system. Um... As mentioned, uh, after that, he moved on to a DWTO, which is a drug treatment and testing order. Um, uh, with that, he was meant to uh, be uh, uh, five days a week. He was meant to go to a, the, the the drug misuse center, which was at uh, Munster Road in Fulham. Uh, but uh, quite often, I mean, he missed his first one. And he missed quite a few after that. Um, uh, the report expresses the opinion that this mismanagement would have led White having had a weak understanding of supervision and with a low regard for the importance of complying. If the start of the DWTO was bad, its, manage its management was to get worse, there was no proper supervision plan, record keeping was poor, the communication was inadequate between the case manager, the programme provider and the testing provider. Um, he uh, tested positive during these tests for cocaine, morphine, opiates and cannabis. Uh, and that that continued right up to the point just before the murder of John Monkton. Um, uh, at the time uh, White attended these, there were, uh, there were relatively few people on the programme. And by White's second week, the staff had formed a clear view that he was not dependent on drugs. They described him as insecure and very committed to presenting himself both as smart and relatively successful. Unlike other people on the Monster Road program, White dressed in designer clothes and drove himself to the centre daily. Uh, although there was no firm evidence available, the representatives of the project considered that White's presentation and lifestyle might well have led someone to see him more as a drug dealer than a user. So there you go. Uh, diving into uh, Damien Hansen, I'm going to grab my coffee again and have a swig. There's very little... Uh, oh, I think I should have put an extra sugar in there. Uh, there's very little information about his early life in here. So um, he has a mother, he has a half-sister who we'll get into shortly. Um, but there's very little uh, information in there about his dad. So it, it looks like his dad uh, may have disappeared early. But we don't really know much about that. Which is why I haven't gone too much into his early life. Uh... Uh, they said he demonstrated serious offending behaviour as a teenager and employed instrumental violence to get what he wanted. He was small, gruff, and had an, the judge described him as having an, an air of evil cunningness about him. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, a pre-sentence report noted, it is interesting to note that the offences occurred when his mother and sister were abroad and the probation officer went on to say my impression of him is of someone with a fairly low self-esteem and self-confidence who is anxious to conform in whatever setting he finds himself uh, as he is likely uh, he is likely to meet more negative than positive influences during the course of his forthcoming sentence what was I going on with that one? Um, yeah, as mentioned, he was ex excluded from primary school, age 10. Uh, he went on to uh, an assessment centre. Uh, now, uh, they said he, his school record was pretty poor and he left unable to read and write, but he went to the assessment centre afterwards when in his teenage sin 
it's like the Young Offenders Institute, and they taught him to read and write. And actually, when he went to prison that first time, uh, he had actually um, got to the point where his reading ability was pretty good, which is why I said at the start, you know, these guys, the, these lads aren't, aren't, you know, thickies who can't read and write. Do you know, they do have some intelligence about them. Do you know, he, uh, in prison, he was reading Sun Tzu's The Art of War, which is not an easy read. So his reading level is pretty good. Um he did actually, I've got some other details here as well, hang on. A report mentioned that Hansen had seemed to have a powerful aversion to any contact or close physical proximity to other people. And although his mother has described him as respectful at home, the approval of peers was of the utmost importance to him. Uh, I think I'll get to his, did I put them in here? Um, why am I asking you? I don't, I don't, oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Right, let's just whiz through. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, two, uh, his uh, criminal record, he had two offences, age 12, which were in the quiz. Well done, me. Uh, after that, um, 6th of September, 1993, he was fined uh, for theft from shops. Again, actually, he was age 13 at that point. No, 12, he was that point 3rd of may 1995 age 14 uh, he was charged with assault abh which is actual bodily harm and and theft he had no prison time but was sent to an attendance center uh with a curriculum of academic education and vocational training uh, where he would learn skills instead of sitting in prison all day uh, and there he learnt to read and write um july 1995 he broke into a house in fulham and stole a briefcase he is arrested and charged with burglary and theft and uh, because of that, found guilty and put on a 12-month conditional uh, discharge, or, or, uh, which, as mentioned, meant he would not be charged with the offence and it would be removed from his record if he didn't re-offend over the next 12 months, which he did. Uh, da, 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 June 1996. Um, he was charged with the unlawful wounding and, uh, and contempt of court for breaking his conditional discharge. He was found guilty of wounding uh, Kevin Jones and sentenced to 18 months in the Young Offenders Institute. Uh, alongside his accomplice, Aston Chu, they attacked the 17-year-old to rob him of £20. Uh, Aston Chu hit the victim in the face with a piece of wood and Handsome stabbed him in the leg with a 7-inch knife, leaving him with a wound that needed 7 stitches. Lovely. Uh, let's just move on. The, um, so after that, upon release from prison, um, they were involved in a, the, the this first attempted murder. So this was on Erkenwald Street, which is the same street that the Wormwood Scrubs police massacre happened. This was at 1 a.m. on the 22nd of August 1997. Damien was 16 years old. His accomplice, Aston Chu, was 17. Um... Uh, a 16-year-old boy, uh, Jamie Al Alcender, I probably got his name wrong, I don't care, uh, was trying to sell them a £3,000 Rolex that he had earlier stole from a woman on Lyle Street in Covent Garden. Um, uh, Hanson was armed with a 12-inch machete, lovely. Chu had a gun. Uh, uh, Jamie Alcender was shot three times as the boy tried to escape. Hansen had a machete in his possession but claimed at the time he did not know about the gun. That's strange because that's exactly what uh, Elliot did. Uh, the victim was seriously wounded and left lying in the street. Uh, Jamie was in stable condition in intensive care. He had undergone major surgery including the removal of his kidney and part of his spleen. Uh, gun damage... He had gun damage to his lung, pancreas, spleen and small in intestines. Um, so from that, uh, Damien was sentenced to prison. Uh, Chu got 15 years. Uh, 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 Damien got 12 because obviously he didn't fire the gun. Uh, as mentioned at the start, he was really struggling in prison at the start because he just couldn't settle. And he had, he had um, six uh, hearings. Uh, because he'd assaulted staff and ducks. He, he should assault ducks and got ducks flying past, being noisy, going, sex, 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 I need sex. Ducks are little bastards. Uh, as are coots. Coots and ducks are bastards. Uh, but but uh, when they moved into, uh, I think it was HMP High Point, I think, yeah, they did. HMP High Point, uh, which was a Category C prison. 
Uh, he was originally in a B. They moved him down to a C. Um, he seemed to be doing well. That's where he started doing more reading. He became much calmer. Um, uh, he started saying that he, he regretted the offence and he felt sorry for his victim. He made use of the library and they gained NVQs and GCSEs in maths, English and business studies. See, he's no, he's no thicky. Um, he had participated in several prison courses, including victim awareness and drug awareness, uh, and said that he wanted to find a hostel away from the area of the offence. Um, but obviously, uh, do you know, uh, this was this was about a year before his per, before he knew he could go for parole. So, whether he actually meant this or whether he was just trying it on, because you know, if your parole's coming up, you've got to put on a good show, haven't you? Um, who knows? Who knows? Anyway, he had uh, two parole applications. The first one was rejected, twenty second of July two thousand and three. The first one happened on the uh, second one happened on the nineteenth of July two thousand and four, and this was the one where. The board basically they didn't even, they didn't interview him. They used uh, a statement that he'd written saying, "Oh yeah, everything's fine," and some notes from his solicitor. Uh, the probation officer hadn't met him in a year, so really didn't know anything. It's just bollocks, really. Even even the, his his offence, which is in the quiz question, uh, which happened when he was twelve, they dismissed as a one off. So you know they were cutting things off left, right, and centre. Um, uh, uh, the OGRS score, as mentioned, uh, said that he had a 91% chance of a high probability of violent reoffending, with 75% considered a high risk. Um, basically, uh, th this really didn't in inform uh, any of their considerations. It, it it kind of looks as if they just kind of ran into this and just went, yeah, let's, you know. Let's just let's just free him. He's ser he served such and such amount of time. I, I guess that's the thing because they've got they've got so many prisoners in prison at the moment, and it's creaking at the seams that we've got to the point now where they're basically saying, "Okay, you serve half your sentence, and then you can be released." Mm. Here's a quote by the Probation Boards Association, uh, who later said uh, he would be supervised by a probation officer. He would be. Uh, this is with regards to the conditions of his license of parole. Um, he would be supervised by a probation officer. He would be seen very regularly, and he and there would be visits at home. And in some cases where the risk is assessed as very high, which should be in his case, there would be police surveillance as well, which there wasn't because they hadn't listed him as high risk. If things work out well, there are some uh, tight checks on how people are behaving and uh, and what people are doing. But no system is foolproof. This is a very sad reflection of that. Uh, if you look at it, actually, his curfew, uh, Damien, who was uh, had been sent to prison for you know violent crimes such as uh, attempted murder, he was held to a curfew of 11 p.m. to 6 p.m. Elliot, who was a drug dealer, was held to a curfew of 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. So actually, Elliot was on a much tougher curfew than a, uh, a convicted attempted murderer. Yeah. Um, in his bail hostel, uh, obviously the the staff at the hostel weren't looking for this. They were looking for they were trained to look for guns and pornography and weapons and things like that. But what they missed was, you know, all of his copies of the Rich Report. Uh, he'd got copies of the Sunday Times Rich List and the Mail on Sunday Rich Report, which also included newspaper cuttings about wealthy city traders, uh, a dossier of wealthy targets, including Formula One boss Bernie Eccleston. Uh, Bank of England Chief Paul Tucker, um, uh, the Duke of Westminster, who's uh, uh, one of um, uh, Britain's wealthiest men. He owns most of Westminster, especially after the uh, British government decided to let him off his inheritance tax. Lovely, which was a good couple of billion pounds, which would have helped the NHS. Thanks, Tories. That's very kind of you. Uh, the Duke of Devonshire as well, a little bit of politics there. Uh, Peter Wood, the multimillionaire chairman of Eshaw and the diamond firm Graf. So he was looking at lots of different people. He had information on the valuation and sale of diamonds. Uh, he in, in court, he keeps referring to the green ones, the green ones. Apparently the green ones are really good diamonds. Uh, he, had, he had a document bearing the registration of a Mercedes owned by a wealthy woman who periodically drove into London. Uh, apparently uh, he was planning to rob her but because she was only temporary in london she actually got uh, you know she disappeared um 
One problem for him that he worked out was that super wealthy people have bodyguards. Uh, uh, so he began following rich women on shopping, shopping trips in Chelsea and Fulham. As he realised they were small, uh, he's small. You got to remember, he's he's only five foot three, so he has to pick women who are even smaller than him. And when you look at Homira Moncton, she is small. She's small. She's petite. So you know he's picking even smaller targets. Uh, he's picking women who are elegantly dressed, you know, top, tottering along on high heels, wearing clothes that are very impractical for kind of regular life, but OK for going into designer shoe shops and things like that. And obviously, if you look at these women uh, carrying handbags, you, you you know full well that if you see a woman's handbag, it's full of credit cards. It's full of her phones. It's full of lots of stuff that you can just nick easily. Probably a ratty little dog as well. You can nick all that and then, you know easy peasy but what he worked out was robbing them in the street probably wasn't a good idea middle of middle of chelsea especially a, a, a young black youth middle of chelsea likelihood he's not going to be able to get near these rich white people so but when, and it's even worse when you go down you go down the side streets kind of where she lives it's do you know i went there and i you know, i'm i'm a, i'm a white male and even I felt awkward there because it was kind of like, you know, not my neighbourhood, not really welcome there. I'm there kind of wearing my shorts. I've got some boots on my cycling helmet. You know, there were cameras everywhere. I could see there was a, a paroling, um, a patrolling, um, a, a, not police patrol, but a security patrol that goes around. And they were watching me. Do you know, they, they saw me with my camera, you know, taking pictures. And they were like, oh, this guy looks suspicious. So, do you know, it must have been like eight times worse for him. So, which is why he made the d decision of doing, you know, pretending to be a postal worker, finding someone who kind of has a cheeky face, getting access to the house. Once you close the door, you can do whatever you like in someone's house. So that was his plan. Um, as mentioned very briefly, who knows, I may have edited it out by this point. Uh, uh, Damien asked for his half-sister, Laura Campbell, who was 20 at the time and lived in Fulham, uh, to uh, uh, provide him with a false alibi. Um, ooh, my stomach is going all grumbly. It's because I'm sitting next to cakes. Uh, the court heard that C C Laura Campbell had repeatedly tried to corrupt her friend, Sade Hay, to endorse her lie, but she refused. Um, Campbell told the police her brother had been watching EastEnders with her at her friend's flat, that's Sade Hay, on the night of the murder. Yet Campbell's version of the night's events which she had also penned down in her black diary looked quite different uh it said monday left about four o'clock these are all the exciting things that you write in a diary she wrote uh Sade met me at the bus stop outside the pizza shop we caught the bus to her house damien phoned to say he was coming i plaited Sade's hair i corn rolled the top of her head in the living room see this is what you write in the diary uh nobody was in uh her entry went on. We watched East, East, East Enders. He, i.e. Hansen, left at about 10 o'clock. Oh, that's convenient because that means he was watching East Enders at the time of the murder. East Enders is normally on about 7.30. Uh, he went to Brixton and I went home. The note, it says here the notes had the appearance of prompt cards which would remind her of the story she would tell, said the prosecutor. Uh, this shows a level of planning and sophistication this plan had and the presentation for giving evidence in court. Uh, Campbell had been on bail since her arrest last year. The judge withdrew her bail and said serious offences demanded a prison term of some length. Uh, she will be jailed on... Uh, she, well, she was jailed because it's an old one. I, how long was she jailed for? I've written it somewhere. I think it was a couple of months. But yeah oh that's that's the last thing that's the last thing on my list because i've written here answer the questions right let's go up let's go up and answer the quiz questions and have a slurp mm. so i hope you enjoyed that that was um that was the trader and the devil's child uh next week next week something different oh right okay uh here's his answer to the questions right what was the name of the shoe shop that homira monkton visited also the same the, the the same shop where it is alleged i have to say alleged because that's what they said in court uh that uh, damien hansen saw Hermira monkton and therefore followed her to her house what was the name of the shop it was via venice aka via venice 
Uh, not there anymore. It's now a pet shop. Uh, if you go, if you go onto the YouTube channel, uh, you will see a video of that. Or, as always, if you if you sign up via Patreon, you get all the videos and all the photos and all the goodies uh, earlier than everyone else. The photos I don't actually post them anywhere else anymore. They're just on Patreon. Ooh. Uh, question two: What type of car did Elliot drive? It was a Ford Mondeo. Question three: That blackbird needs to shut up. Uh, question three: How seats shut up now? And now it hasn't. Oh, the HS2 has just started. God, I'm glad I'm up early because it's uh, it's not even half seven and they've started. And this is echoing along the valley. Uh, question three: How much money was it said that Elliot owed to drug dealers? It was two thousand pounds. Although at the time of the arrest, in his glove box, in his glove box, they found three thousand pounds. So uh, yeah. Uh, question four: Name the takeaway that Damien and Elliot went to. This was immediately after the murder. It was uh, the Best West Caribbean Takeaway, which was uh, on Uxbridge Road. I did a search. I can't find out where it used to be because it, it changed its name a couple of times. And there's been quite a few Caribbean takeaways uh, on that road. Uh, question five Elliot was held under a HDC but what does that stand for that is a home detention curfew question six Damien was convicted of what crime age 12 there was uh, technically three really but the main one I was thinking of was indecently assaulting a woman or girl uh, we don't really know much about this hence I put woman or girl but uh, yeah he was convicted of indecently assaulting a female when he was age 12 years old. Lovely. What a lovely chap. Age 7, Elliot was stabbed in what two... Uh, uh, age 7? Uh, question 7. I've gone, I've gone mental. Question Question 7. Elliot was stabbed in what two places? His left hand and his left arm. So when he was holding uh, Peter Monkton in kind of a bear hug, Elliot came up and started repeatedly stabbing Peter Monkton and uh, whilst he was doing that he stabbed uh, Elliot in his left hand and arm lovely uh, question 8 what make of garage did they purchase the petrol from for the fire it was a BP garage over in Wandsworth I think it was on Swanson Lane I think uh, question 9 uh, what f uh, question 9 what floor was Isabel on when she witnessed the murder uh, she was on the top floor, which was the second floor, because it, it was uh, it was four story, but it was basement, ground floor, first floor, second floor. Uh, uh, question ten: Damien stayed in what number room at the bail hostel? It was number two. There we go. There we go. How did you do? Did you do okay? Did you get Did you get more than four? More than four. Was that good? More than four? More than five? more than six more than six i can't hear you i don't know why i'm asking anyway that's that uh, i've got to do some editing i've got lots of editing to do i'm trying to catch up because this weekend i'm actually away hooray I, i'm gonna my 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 brother is 50 he's the big 50 so we're doing a surprise birthday it's fine i can mention this because it's in two days time and this episode won't come out for another week because it'll take me that long to edit this bastard. Uh, so I've, I've got to do lots of editing, uh, lots of late nights to get this done. And then I can go and see him and we can socially distance. Oh, we can have a socially distanced meetup of a handful of people in a garden on a wet weekend. Looking forward to it. Anyway, it'd be nice to meet. Nice to see people again. Good. That's all good. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, we will be back with more Murder Mile next week. So thank you very much. Uh, I was going to say enjoy the show, but you've you've already listened to it. Oh, my brain's gone. It's because it's because it's cake here, cake, and I'm tired. It's too early. All right. Uh, have yourself a good week. Be good. Lots of love. Stay safe. Bye. <laughs>